Hello there and a very, very warm welcome to my YouTube. My name's Chris and in this film I'm going to take a look, well I'm going to take a look at Supermarine in general and in particular their amphibious aircraft. We're going to finish up looking at the Supermarine Sea Otter but to start with we'll look at the development of these amphibious aircraft which began back in 1920 with the Supermarine Seagull which was powered by a single Napier Lion engine. In 1925, the UK Admiralty advised the Royal Australian Air Force that they should acquire seagulls to serve on the new seaplane carrier then being constructed. From February 1929 to April 1933, six Supermarine Seagulls served on board. A pair of Seagulls were entered with the Air Ministry's authorization for the 1924 Kings Cup air race. The Supermarine Seagulls were withdrawn from active service or scrapped in 1936. They were superseded by the Supermarine Seagull 5. The Supermarine Seagull 5 was later renamed the Supermarine Walrus due to significant design changes that made it a distinctly new aircraft. The Supermarine Walrus was a robust all-metal amphibious biplane that served as a fleet spotter, reconnaissance aircraft and possibly more importantly on air-sea rescue and it served various Allied air forces from 1935 until the late 1950s. The Supermarine Sea Otter was intended to replace the Supermarine Walrus in the Royal Air Force reconnaissance and search and rescue missions the Supermarine Sea Otter became the final R.J. Mitchell design to enter service. The first flight took place on the 23rd of September 1938. But it was not until January 1942 that the Air Ministry placed a production order. Due to cooling troubles found with the Perseus, the power plant was changed for production aircraft to the Bristol Mercury driving a three-bladed propeller. The Supermarine Sea Otter entered a squadron service in November 1944, and that was well towards the end of World War II. The main difference between the Walrus and the Sea Otter was in the mounting of the power plant. The Walrus had a rear-facing engine with a pusher propeller, and the Sea Otter's engine faced forward with a tractor propeller. Post-war, Sea Otters were converted for civilian use, the cabin was soundproofed and fitted with heating, seating for four passengers, a chemical toilet and stowage for baggage was provided, as they were intended for use as bush aeroplanes. As time went on, the Western Dragonfly helicopter became the first British-built helicopter which was to be used by the Royal Navy, and they were intended to replace both the Supermarine Walrus and the Sea Otter. Many Walrus and Sea Otters did reach their final days in Australia in the 1950s and they were used fairly extensively as, uh, as, as possibly people thought for bush planes, for landing in remote places. They were a very, very versatile aircraft. Now, interestingly, RJ Mitchell met with the Air Ministry to discuss the Supermarine Sea Otter on the 17th of April 1936. So as far back as 1936, they were looking at a replacement for the Supermarine Walrus. On that date, following Supermarine's submission of technical details, including detailed drawings and costings for the aircraft, the Air Ministry issued instructions to proceed with building two prototypes. It was also stipulated that the design was to be capable of operating from the carrier HMS Furious, to be limited to a 46-foot wingspan, and be equipped for both carrier and cruiser-based operation. It had to offer longer range and even a dive bombing capability. This was in addition to matching the existing standards achieved by the Walrus, such as stressing for catapult launching. The first tests of Sea Otter K8854 in September 1938 used a two-bladed fixed-pitch wooden propeller. 
as a conventional four-bladed arrangement would have fouled the cruiser hangar ceilings. However, Supermarine's chief test pilot, George Pickering, was only able to get the Type 309 up onto the step in this configuration, replacing it with a two-position three-bladed de Havilland propeller on on the 29th of September was enough to get the amphibian off the water but only after a 30 second run with a sluggish climb an innovative solution tried was a scissor arrangement of the two fixed pitch wooden propellers set at 35 degrees rather than the usual 90 this finally enabled the aircraft now officially named Sea Otter to undertake successful flight trials Pickering submitted the first formal report on its performance on the 11th of January 1939, the initial stalling speed being 54 knots, 62 miles an hour, and the die speed of 178 miles an hour. This was followed in February by sea recovery trials conducted with HMS Pegasus. First production sea otter, serial JM738, was test flown by Geoffrey Quill, from Somerton Cows in January 1943, a year after the production order had been placed, and more than three years after the prototype's first flight. It underwent trials from land at Worthy Down and Southampton Water initially, and then with the Marine Aircraft Air Experimental Establishment at Helensburgh. Testing was expanded with a second example, JM739, in, 19, in April 1943, and it underwent catapult trials at an overloaded weight of £10,250 at Farnborough and from HMS Pegasus. Production compromised of 250 machines, and in all honesty, the RAF were re reflecting that the change in role from spotting to rescue Sea Otter production ended with the delivery of RD-922 on the 13th of July 1946. An order from Saro in the VF-350 serial series was cancelled due to the war's end, cutting short the proposed 592 example production run. As an interesting footnote, Supermarine received instructions from the Air Ministry to proceed with the Type 347, which was could be called the Supermarine Seagull, with lobbying from Supermarine led by the type's creator, Joseph Smith, who'd been appointed as company chief designer in 1941. The specified engine was upgraded to the Rolls-Royce Griffin of 1,720 horsepower, and it was confirmed on the 27th of November 1944 in the new specific specification S1444 and the role became Air Sea Rescue and Reconnaissance Flying Boat. The Griffin-powered Supermarine Seagull did fly in 1948, but never entered RAF operational service. We hope you found this uh, short film on the Supermarine Amphibious Aircraft interesting. I'll try and put some more together because a lot, quite a lot happened with the... Um, Supermarine Sea Otters and the Warriors is post-war. I have got a film on my YouTube channel about it as well. And it'd be great if you could subscribe, check it out. In any event, please take the greatest care and I'll see you on the next film. All the very best. Cheers for now.